All right, everybody. Uh, so we're going to get started. So today, our speaker is uh, Dr. Sciano, a medical director of liver transplantation. He's going to talk to us today about uh, recurrent disease post liver transplant. And the fellows, and, yeah, this is a really important topic uh, for the boys. So, uh, All right, thank you, much. thank you, Jim. Um, good afternoon. Uh, uh, this changed over time because at, at, at one point. Recurrent disease, specifically from hepatitis C, was a major problem and was the bane of the existence of the transplant hepatologist. This is no longer the case quite um, miraculously. So I think again, my talk has morphed over, uh, over time, and a lot of the stuff on hepatitis C is going to be more of a historical uh, interest, uh, in, especially to our fellows. We, we don't see the, the severe recurrence any, anymore. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, retransplantation um, as well. So we'll get started. Um, this uh, a, a backdrop about uh, 12 to 15 percent of all patients that are uh, transplanted may actually require retransplant uh, within their within their lifetime for one of uh, for one of many reasons. Uh, currently, the need for higher MELT score, scores often precludes retransplant suitability. So there are a lot of patients who probably need a tra uh, another transplant, would benefit from another transplant, but their MELT scores are low in the current system, and when their MELT scores climb to the degree where they would be candidates, they often are, are, are more abundant at that time, and um, we, we don't uh, uh, proceed. Uh, thus, these patients have higher weightless mortality because of this issue with the MELT score. As you might expect, they have a, a higher risk of infection. Uh, if you develop allograft failure, you have ascites, complications of portal hypertension. In the setting of immunosuppression, it's quite understandable why, why infection is, uh, mm -hmm. is a problem. So for the patients that do come to need another transplant, invariably they have some renal dysfunction, and thus they may need a simultaneous liver kidney uh, uh, transplant. Many of them have diabetes, being overweight after their initial transplant. These are comorbid um, uh, risk factors. Uh, there are challenging technical demands with any retransplant. Remember that uh, the, the one-year patient in graft survival after a retransplant is significantly lower than a primary transplant, in large part related to the, uh, the likelihood of finding adhesions for our surgical team and patients already having vascular and biliary uh, complications. And unequivocally, the development of clinical portal hypertension in an allograft uh, further increases um, uh, uh, the patient's morbidity. Now, um, 10 to 15 percent of patients who get a second transplant actually require a third uh, transplant. Um, uh, most studies indicate poor outcomes with repeated transplants. I, get, I think this is very uh, intuitive. And interestingly, the biggest gap in survival occurs between the first and second transplant. Um, but it's not much worse between the third and um, uh, the third and fourth. Um, the, the outcome, the poor outcomes actually occur quite early, and this is related to, again, infection, renal failure as the patient is coming out of the, uh, out of the surgery. The etiology for the second and third retransplants is typically similar as the, as the first. So PNF is primary non-function, hepatic artery thrombosis, chronic rejection, and then cryptogenic liver failure, which I'll allude to on um, uh, later on. So um, almost every liver disease can recur uh, post-liver transplant. We've, I've broken them down um, uh, uh, in, into these categories. Uh, how do you diagnose uh, disease recurrence? Well, there's a broad differential uh, diagnosis with uh, uh, DILI, uh, NAFLD, uh, malignancy, either a de novo malignancy, lymphoma, uh, acute and chronic rejection. This is the main reason why we do post liver transplant um, biopsies, non hepatic trophic uh, viral infections, infections such as CMV, um, uh, EBV. So, thus, a, a frequent liver biopsy may be necessary in these patients. And I think this is what we, uh, what we teach. Uh, I mean, having the, the histology is very, very important in, um, in this. Um, differential diagnosis, because the cholestatic versus hepatocellular pattern is not really helpful in discerning what's going on. Obviously, if you have a positive CMB serology, it's, it, it's very helpful, but that often isn't um, uh, the case. Uh, 
we all are trying to get fiber skin more in, uh, into our um, armamentarium. Really, to date, there's been an unestablished role of, of, of fiber uh, scan in, in discerning these, um, uh, these different etiologies. So some clues to diagnosis if this is, in fact, recurrent disease. Recent change in immunosuppression or other medications. So if you have someone who has normal liver tests, you lower their prograph, and then a month later you check the labs, and the liver tests are up. I think you have to suspect maybe there's a rejection. Rejection's uh, almost always um, asymptomatic. If people come in febrile with constitutional symptoms, this is something that uh, leads you to think that this could be a CMV infection, especially if it uh, is within the first three to four months after um, the transplant. People who reject once are at risk for rejecting again. So I think this is very, very important to uh, ascertain in your in your history. Go, you go back and you look to see if they've had uh, previous um, uh, liver biopsies. This will always um, assist you in trying to figure out what's going on. And the timing of abnormal liver tests. So when we had issues with recurrent hepatitis C, the liver test went up um, two weeks after the transplant. We knew that this was not recurrent <coughs> hep C. We, we knew this is probably um, a technical issue, a stricture, or, uh, or rejection. Uh, so the timing of the abnormal liver chemistry test is very, very important. So we're going to start off with uh, uh, autoimmune liver diseases. And uh, all of them can recur after a liver transplant. But allograft failure uh, can occur with recurrent autoimmune hepatitis, or PSC. So one rule of thumb is that patients really do not develop allograft failure and need another transplant from recurrent PBC. Um, I've seen one patient who had allograft failure. They were transplanted in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, 30 years ago from recurrent PBC. So it's possible the longer one, one goes, but I, I think it's very rare uh, that you're going to, to see this. Uh, the other dictum that we follow is that rejection rates are, are higher in people who have autoimmune liver disease, be it autoimmune hepatitis, PSC, or PBC, although there doesn't seem to be an appreciable impact on long-term overall survival. Um, for people who have autoimmune liver disease, there seems to be an increased incidence of late rejection. And it's important to, to understand about the late rejection. I would define it as, say, more than a year after the transplant because the histologic findings, I think, are less pathognomonic than, than, than you typically see using the BAMF um, criteria. Uh, in the pediatric population, there seems to be a higher uh, rate of rejection in children who um, are transplanted for fulminant liver failure. So it makes me always think that it's somehow uh, immunologically um, uh, related. And I think that this is very similar for, for adults as, as well. Uh, there really is no consistency to the autoimmune markers following um, uh, the transplant. And I think the, the key here is that sometimes these patients can follow a smoldering course. So we, I think many of us have seen patients who have had, who have normal liver chemistry tests or mildly abnormal liver chemistry tests, and then when we work them up, we find that they have appreciable histologic um, uh, damage. I think it's very important. You know the patients, you follow them, and um, this is a, a scenario where, personally, I am using a fiber scan um, in, in patients to, um, uh, to prompt me sometimes to do a liver biopsy. So uh, recurrent PSC, I, I think uh, it's safe to say the incidence varies between 10 and 30 percent. But I think also that this depends on your definition. If you have someone who was transplanted for PSC 30 years ago, uh, I guarantee you they're going to have mildly abnormal liver tests, if anything. This is the same natural history of the disease uh, before the transplant. So I think that the true incidence is probably a lot higher if you define it by the presence of abnormal liver chemistry uh, tests on a chronic basis. Graft loss is uh, infrequent, um, but we do see it more commonly in, in the, the long-term survivors, say, in our own program when we started doing transplants um, uh, 30 years ago. So people who uh, underwent transplant for PSC 30 years ago, we, we start to see that they're, they're, they may be having problems with um, with their biliary system. There really is no data on the benefits of, of, of the use of ursodiol as a preventative 
measure. I think if someone has recurrent PSC, there's no downside to, uh, to putting them on it. As I mentioned, patients have a higher incidence of, of, of acute rejection. And I think the other sort of pearl here is it's difficult to differentiate recurrent PSC commonly from chronic rejection. Remember that chronic rejection, you, you lose the bile ducts. So histologically, recurrent PSCs, you have bile duct damage. So if you've lost a lot of the bile ducts, you may not readily see recurrent um, PSC. So I think you have to keep that in mind. So one definition of recurrent PSC is a confirmed diagnosis of PSC pre-transplant. And then uh, intra and extra hepatic biliary stricturing, beating irregularity more than 30 days post-transplant. Uh, these are the, the histologic changes that you, you see. You, you see the typical uh, onion skin um, lesion. Um, patients may need a PTC, or now that uh, most of the patients are getting duct to duct and anastomosis, you can get an ERCP uh, on them. In the, in the past, uh, they needed a PTC, which was, was um, much more uh, problematic. So what are the features of PSC recurrence of persistent cholestasis? Your alkaline phosphatase is mild to moderately elevated. Patients have non-anastomotic strictures, so you have intrahepatic uh, stricturing. You see the histologic changes on the, on the right, periductal inflammation and fibrosis is the onion skin lesion. Typically, this occurs more than six months post-transplant. Uh, uh, there really are no pre-liver transplant predictors of who is going to... Um, develop recurrent PSC. Interestingly, though, that it, it, it seems patients who've had a colectomy for IBD before their transplant seem not to have a, as many problems with PSC recurrence after transplant. So, you know, the classic teaching is that PSC and IBD activity are unrelated. My own bias is that if people have severe IBD after the liver transplant, um, that they run into problems from their PSC. Differential diagnosis of recurrent PSC. Obviously, we all know that the hepatic artery feeds the biliary plexus. So if you have any interruption of blood flow to the hepatic artery, you can develop a PSC type picture, biliary ischemia. Uh, the differential between established ductopenic rejection can be uh, uh, difficult. Remember, ABO incompatible livers um, develop um, biliary, uh, can develop biliary abnormalities. That's why some research is centered on biliary abnormalities looking into uh, them being immune mediated. And a lot of the fellows know about the, the use of non heart beating donors where ischemic cholangiopathy um, uh, can be a significant complication of this type of uh, transplant. <coughs> when patients develop problems, retransplant may actually be problematic because they can often develop uh, recurrent resistant infections. They may not have low MELT scores. I mean, unless their creatinine goes up, they may have an intact bilirubin level, so it's very difficult to retransplant uh, uh, these patients. The colitis management can be complex in people who have PSC and IBD. Remember, PROGRAF doesn't really have any beneficial effect on um, uh, IBD activity after the transplant. Uh, biologics are okay. Um, we have a lot of patients who are being managed with biologic therapy for their colitis after uh, transplant. And uh, the other important thing is we do see uh, patients who have different forms of autoimmune liver disease, PSC, PBC, who develop de novo uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And it appears that people who have PSC may be at a particular risk um, uh, for this. So we're going to segue to, um, uh, to PBC. On the right, you see the, the, the classic um, flora duct uh, lesion. So histologically, post-transplant, it's confirmed by the presence of the flora duct lesions and, and lesion and granulomas. Um, uh, recurrence is up to 25% over, uh, over time based on biopsy. So I think the, the same caveat holds for PBC as PSC in that uh, if you go long enough, probably all of these patients are going to have mild recurrences but with PBC, you're not going to develop allograft failure. As I mentioned, de novo autoimmune hepatitis is something that uh, can complicate um, uh, PBC. This is uh, an old article now, but it's from the University of Pittsburgh, and it, 
really puts in perspective with regard um, uh, the recurrence. Because if you look at the, the numbers here, where even though it was 20 years ago, but they did so many transplants, 420 patients with PBC they followed and 303 with PSC. I think our program has been going for 30 years, and I think we probably have about 250 patients uh, that we've transplanted for <coughs> PSC. So this puts it in perspective and why I think this is still a, uh, an, import, an important article. So you see the, um, uh, the recurrence rates over, um, over a 10-year um, period. And as you can see here uh, also that after 10 years, 7% of patients with PSC needed uh, retransplantation while uh, no one in, in PBC. There's also some um, uh, uh, data to suggest that patients with PSC may have a higher incidence of hepatic artery thrombosis after their transplant, which may also um, um, uh, affect this retransplant necessity. The same with, as with PSC, recurrent PBC may be uh, difficult to differentiate from chronic rejection histologically. Again, if you don't have the bile duct, you can't see any pre-existing bile duct uh, damage. There's no downside to using Urso. We, we put people on this who, who have elevated alkaline phosphatases uh, uh, chronically. Uh, which probably denotes a, a recurrence of their, their PBC. And uh, just a note, to always remember to follow your patient's bone density because these patients are at particular risk for developing severe hepatic osteodystrophy and, and, um, and osteopenia, osteoporosis. In segueing to autoimmune hepatitis, um, uh, the incidence is, is quite high. And a lot of this you might expect. Remember, the, the defect is in the immune system. It's not in the liver per se. So you're not transplanting the immune system. You're transplanting the, the liver. So I would expect that a lot of these patients recur. And that's why some programs leave patients on a small dose of maintenance um, uh, steroids. It's very rare to uh, occur in the first year post-transplant. So I think that's an important point in understanding your differential if the liver tests go, uh, go up. Uh, often it occurs after your immunosuppression has been um, uh, tapered. Um, I typically don't leave patients on um, uh, maintenance steroids. If they're on uh, Cellcept, I think that that's adequate. We just continue to follow the patient uh, closely. The thing to remember, this is the condition where you can have a smoldering disease despite fairly well-preserved uh, uh, liver uh, function. And we've seen cases over the years of patients developing al allograft cirrhosis and, uh, and failure. And um, you treat it the same way um, with uh, uh, azathioprine, MMF, or, um, or steroids. So uh, de novo autoimmune hepatitis or, or plasma cell hepatitis is uh, uh, really an unexplained type of graft um, dysfunction. We tried to learn about this. Uh, over the years, when uh, hepatitis C was a problem, it was associated with very poor outcomes uh, in, in patients with um, concurrent hepatitis C. Uh, in many cases, it's, res it's responsive to autoimmune hepatitis treatment, but in some cases, it's not. And I think many of us have had patients who've had the noble autoimmune hepatitis that really have, has not been responsive, and these people come to needing um, uh, another transplant. Uh, really, you, you can't uh, differentiate between plasma cell hepatitis or de novo autoimmune hepatitis and true autoimmune hepatitis. So I'm going to ask our pathology fellow now, is that, from your experience, is that, is that true? Can, is there any difference? Could you, could you blindly tell the difference between the two? Yeah. And so for the pathology, liver pathology attending, is that true? <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that, that is true. And you can see that this portal tract on the left is so expanded. That could be a plastic cell hepatitis case, or it could be a native liver having a really bad uh, you know, risk uh, of immune hepatitis. And uh, one um, unique thing about uh, plastic cell hepatitis is that you also see the central lobular area that's on the right, where you see loads of plasma cells. In an area of uh, bridging and central lobular 
So um, this may have a, a smoldering co course, as I, I, I mentioned, and why some programs actually continue to do protocol liver biopsies. I actually am a fan of, uh, uh, of doing this. Um, autoimmune markers may not be helpful, but you may see hypergammaglobulinemia in these patients. I mean, the current thinking has evolved with this, and, and it's now felt that this is probably a variant of rejection, whether it is a variant of late rejection or what we're thinking now is um, it's a manifestation of antibody-mediated rejection, which is a, uh, an increasingly um, um, noted uh, phenomenon in our, in our patients on, on the liver side. Um, chronic hepat hepatitis of this type is increasingly recognized post-transplant and as a cause of graft loss. And this is a greater issue in the pediatric uh, population. I think that chronic hepatitis, and idiopathic uh, post-transplant hepatitis are becoming more common reasons for graft loss in the, in the pediatric population. Again, this may be a similar uh, a variant. So I, I uh, talked about uh, antibody media rejection. We, we had a, a conference. Uh, Ben gave a great conference on Friday about, the, about a patient um, with this. These are some of the, the myriad of histologic changes that you may see for AMR, and at least they should alert us to the possibility that uh, these, uh, these are present. I, I want to highlight uh, the presence of portal venopathy and nodular regenerative hyperplasia and the cause of non serotic portal hypertension. If you see these in a post liver transplant uh, biopsy, you have to think maybe this patient has antibody mediated um, uh, rejection. The other thing, when you when you go to sign out and you hear that the terms sinusoidal fibrosis, central lobular necrosis, these things should uh, alert you to the possibility of um, of antibody mediated rejection. And again, over time, I, I've become more convinced that the plasma cell hepatitis is a form of um, antibody-mediated rejection. So we're all going to segue from the autoimmune liver diseases to the, the other more common liver diseases that we, um, that we see. So for NASH, uh, we're all concerned about NASH in the pre-transplant um, setting, but what about post-transplant? Really, to date, honestly, studies show that graft loss is very infrequent. Have we seen people develop? advanced fibrosis, yeah, um, but it's, it's not common. Maybe that's because these patients uh, can succumb to cardiovascular morbidity um, in the years uh, immediately following the transplant. And if they lived long enough, maybe they would develop uh, problems. Remember that weight gain and diabetes are extremely common after transplant. So the same um, uh, scenario exists for these patients um, after their transplant. So bariatric surgery is becoming an appealing option. Uh, a lot of centers are not uh, doing this after transplant. We've, we've had a couple of patients go for bariatric surgery successfully. Uh, some programs are doing this at the time of the liver transplant. We're not um, uh, really there yet. When patients had a problem with recurrent hepatitis C, if they had concurrent fatty liver, it predicted a worse outcome and patients were less responsive to treatment. Again, we really don't have to worry about this miraculously uh, anymore with the, um, uh, with the DAAs. Um, uh, insulin resistance occurs commonly uh, post-transplant, and it may be present with advanced fibrosis despite ALT elevation. And this is where, in my practice, I'm using fiber scans in, um, uh, in patients uh, to see if they have any advanced fibrosis, because I think this can sneak up on uh, uh, patients uh, sometimes. So I am getting fiber scans on these patients at least once after the transplant to see uh, how their graft is doing, even if the liver tests are normal. So we're transplanting a lot of patients who have alcoholic uh, liver disease, uh, despite all our uh, 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 comprehensive ways of trying to prevent recidivism, probably 20, 30 percent of people return to drinking. Um, uh, despite recidivism, patients have excellent long-term outcome. It's not that uh, alcoholics have a high incidence of rejection that you um, uh, might fear if uh, they went back to drinking and they were non-compliant with, with medication. So this is one of the arguments that many people use. Well, 
you know, we're putting up a roadblock for transplanting patients who may not have the, the, the length of sobriety, but, you know, they take care of their liver after transplant. Why are we denying them this, um, uh, this treatment option? Uh, remember to the, again, to the fellows, you, you see the patients in the clinic, uh, alcoholics have increased ENT cancer risk, so you have to follow them um, quite closely. When alcoholic hepatitis does develop from recidivism after transplant, it has a horrible prognosis. I've seen three or four of these patients, they all, um, they all die. So, um, in the, in the early 1990s, um, Medicare actually withdrew approval for liver transplant for hepatitis B, and that was because um, the hepatitis B recurred in the new graft, and it recurred very rapidly, um, and the, the histologic um, uh, name for this is fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis, and this uh, was, was also an issue for uh, hepatitis B. C. And I'm going to, again, just stop for a second and ask uh, Isabel and Camilla just to describe this. And the reason is that we're not seeing this anymore. And we may never see this again, thankfully, because this was a, a very foreboding diagnosis and almost all of these patients lost their graft. So, um, I'll, I'll speak for Camilla because she hasn't seen this, fortunately. Um, yeah, there is a lot of cholestasis, but there's also a characteristic uh, pattern of the fibrosis where you see this uh, delicate connective tissue emanating from the portal tract, almost choking the hepatocytes around the portal area. So this is characteristic, almost uh, similar to what you see in large bowel duct obstruction, but in this setting of uh, post-transplant with hep B and very high variable or hep C for that matter, uh, you correlate with the histology. And mm -hmm. the, so what was typical is that patients would develop profound hyperbilirubinemia, and uh, it would be called they would be called static. So your immune transferases would not be very high, maybe at most in the, the 200, 250 range. And what was also typical of this diagnosis was the viral loads were off the chart. You know, I think they would they would register at more than 170 million. That's how the lab um, uh, would do it. And um, this was before the use of nucleoside analogs and, uh, and HBIG. We didn't have anything to offer the patient, so they developed very rapid, almost a subfulminant liver failure, portal hypertension, and, uh, and died. However, they started using hepatitis B immunoglobulin um, in, the, in the early 1990s. The, the uh, seminal um, uh, article was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1993 from... Uh, from the French group, and this really revolutionized uh, transplantation for hepatitis B. 20% of people still um, uh, recurred for uh, one reason or, uh, or another, but it got to the point where from in the early 1990s, Medicare withdrew um, uh, approval for transplant for hepatitis B to 20 years later that patients with hepatitis B did better than any group of individuals because of hepatitis B uh, uh, immunoglobulin. So what you did was you gave massive amounts of hepatitis B immunoglobulin in the anapatic phase and immediately post-transplant. Uh, and then monthly, they would get uh, treatment for the rest of their life. They would get uh, an IV infusion of HBIG, the same medication that um, uh, uh, children receive after they're, um, uh, they're born and their mom is, has hepatitis B. Um, uh, one sort of interesting note that we found over the years is that many of these patients were transplanted for hepatitis B. HCC is uh, the, the main reason for this. And when the HCC recurs, it seems that the hepatitis B recurs. And I, I can't readily um, I explain that, but I, th this is a true phenomenon that we've, uh, we've seen over time. So... If you see someone who's doing well and then their hepatitis B surface antigen becomes positive or they become viremic despite treatment, always think that maybe their HCC has recurred um, somewhere. So um, the viral load going into transplant and hepatitis delta status affect recurrence rates. So for instance, if you go into the transplant, you have a very high viral load, the chance that you're going to um, recur is much higher. Patients who had hepatitis D don't recur because typically their viral loads are not that high going into the 
um, uh, the transplant. So nowadays, I would say since the, the arrival of the, of, of the nucleoside analogs in um, uh, the, the mid-1990s, almost all patients are aviremic going into transplant. So this has allowed the transplant programs to experiment with not giving HBIG, because now you're aviremic going into the, um, uh, the transplant. So everyone has been toying with the, the use of uh, uh, oral therapy. So we've gone from lifelong monthly HBIG to one year, and now we're down to three months in, in people who are aviremic going into transplant. Some programs are giving um, uh, oral monotherapy starting immediately after the transplant and not using um, uh, HBIG. So I think, again, this has evolved, um, evolved over time. Just a note about the use of hepatitis B core antibody positive donors. So if the donor is a true core antibody positive and the recipient is surface antibody negative and core antibody negative, there's actually a 40% risk of, of transmitting hepatitis B. So these patients get uh, prophylaxis. Um, uh, and that's um, a lifelong. Um, breakthrough mutations are, are possible. Dr. Leung published a series of, of four patients who they were on treatment, but they developed breakthrough mutations and developed recurrent um, uh, hepatitis B. The presence of concurrent surface antibody, however, in the, um, in the recipient lessens the incidence of this breakthrough and of the, um, uh, the recurrence. But we've had patients who were doing fine, and then a decade after their transplant, they stopped their entecavir or lamivudine, and they develop recurrent hepatitis B. So right now, it's a, a lifelong a prophylaxis that we use. So I, I, I mentioned uh, recurrent uh, HCC. I'm just going to touch on it briefly, that um, recurrence uh, occurs in the allograft liver and, and in the lung. But uh, very often, you may actually not readily find, find it. Um, uh, it's important to know the AFP status of the tumor pre-transplant. Well, if you have uh, an AFP transplant, if it recurs, it's going to make AFP. So you can really use that as a guide um, to following uh, uh, patients. Um, right now, by protocol, we're using the mTOR inhibitors such as um, a rapimune and, and erolimus. I think that the, the jury is still out whether um, uh, they do prevent the HCC from recurring. And I think the other thing that we've we've learned is that HCC can occur de novo in patients who've developed allograft cirrhosis, almost always from recurrent hepatitis C. So if you have someone who has allograft cirrhosis, you have to screen them for HCC as you would your, um, uh, your typical cirrhotic uh, patient. So um, the natural history of, of recurrent hepatitis C um, was a, a major problem uh, for us. So if your hep C viral load was positive going into transplant, it was going to be positive after um, mm -hmm. uh, the transplant, sometimes as early as right in the operating room in the anapatic phase of the, of the transplant. What I would quote my patients is that, you know, 25% of you will develop cirrhosis and may need another transplant within five years, and that number was 50% at 10 years. Very, very uh, sobering. Um, and a lot of the patients just remained with slight to moderate elevations in their, in their ALT. And most programs did protocol biopsies, and then we would struggle with, well, if they have stage 1 fibrosis, do we treat them with the toxic medications we had at the time? Do we wait until stage 2? So it was very difficult to manage um, these patients. Typically, when they became cholestatic, however, this often denoted a more severe um, recurrence, like the fibrosin cholestatic hepatitis that, that Isabel described. The differential diagnosis was, again, difficult. You know, could you have acute or chronic rejection? CMV, a, a DILI, 20% of people can develop vascular problems after their, uh, their liver transplant. So very often, we needed to do a lot of uh, uh, biopsies. Important thing historically to note was that patients who developed CMV or patients who had biliary obstruction seemed to be associated with a more severe um, recurrence. So when we had someone who had severe recurrence, 
what, what did we do? We tried to make sure they didn't have rejection. We biopsied them, and then we would get an MRI to make sure they didn't have a biliary obstruction before we decided on trying to treat their recurrent hepatitis C, again, with the medications we had uh, at hand back, uh, back then. So some of the other features associated with severe recurrent hepatitis C were older donor age. This is a phenomenon that has been really time-tested uh, across all programs. You know, why older donor age was um, uh, problematic, we still don't know, but it's probably because the liver is not as um, robust at regenerating uh, as, we, uh, as, as we suspect. This was to the point where some programs would not use a donor greater than age 60 in uh, a recipient who had hepatitis C. Again, this is all fallen by the wayside with the new DAAs. Parenteral corticosteroids are bad. Oral corticosteroids were not. And this was something that I learned o over time in that, you know, when we had someone with severe recurrent hep C, what did we do? We tried to help them so we would minimize their immunosuppression with the thought process being that that's going to help them. But I think we ran into problems because then these people rejected. So oral steroids are not really the, the, the main issue, but giving parenteral steroids, say, for the treatment of rejection was. And it was very difficult to differentiate the biopsies in people who had mild hep C and rejection. And I think very often patients were treated for rejection when they didn't have to, and this ultimately made their hepatitis C um, uh, worse. And obviously, the earlier the, the histologic occurrence of the hepatitis C and the higher the viral load uh, portended a worse prognosis. So again, this is a, an article that I, is, is old, but I, I feel really conveys the, uh, the message. So the, one of the, the, the first seminal articles looking at the natural history of hep C cirrhosis found that once you um, uh, develop cirrhosis histologically, you have a 10% decompensation rate within three years of that initial diagnosis. However, once you had histologic cirrhosis post liver transplant, your risk of your rate of decompensation was 60%. So that again became the goal of, of antiviral treatment was to prevent the development of cirrhosis. And once you had allograft cirrhosis from recurrent hepatitis C, you can see what your three-year survival was. It was, it, w it was not good. And then when you try to retransplant these patients, they're very, very sick, and the retransplant success was, um, uh, was low. So uh, the, the typical natural history of, of, of hepatitis C was that you would develop a very early uh, recurrence. You would have an elevation of your liver chemistry test in the first within the first four months uh, after the transplant. And everyone went on to develop mildly abnormal liver uh, uh, tests. And with time, you could see one to 15 years, half of patients developed um, uh, cirrhosis. So transplant programs started using preemptive therapy. So at the time, we only had interferon and ribavirin. So they would say, well, let's give people interferon and ribavirin early after the transplant. So any of you have taken care of these very sick liver patients, you can imagine giving them interferon and ribavirin was a big uh, problem. And uh, this really did not even show any success in preventing severe um, uh, recurrence. And uh, a small number of people went on to develop fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis, and almost all of these patients um, uh, needed another uh, uh, transplant. So, you know, before, uh, the DAAs came out in thinking about treating uh, patients before or after transplant. Since, since antiviral treatment after transplant, um, I'm intimating to you, is, is very difficult. Well, why don't we try to treat them pre-transplant? Very costly, labor-intensive. The SVR rates with interferon-based therapy were very low. In, in um, genotype uh, uh, 1 patients, it was about 10%. SVR a little bit better with genotype 2 and interestingly with genotype 3 at the time, but significant morbidity and mortality of patients. You didn't know when they were going to get transplanted, um, so often therapies were, uh, were truncated. So using interferon after transplant, very poor tolerability of patients and thus for patients and thus we were very hesitant to, to, to pull the trigger and, and start uh, uh, treating them. And when we did, they ran into problems. Interferon clearly can cause 
um, uh, rejection after transplant. So then we run into problems with treating the hepatitis C with interferon, but then uh, we develop, um, we cause the patient to develop uh, rejection. So um, when the first generation DAAs came out, um, if, you, if any of you recall them, the bosepravir and the telaprevir, they improved SVR rates, but they were very difficult to use. A lot of patients ended up in the hospital with infections and, and, and anemia. We were very happy to to have them, but we were still using them with interferon, and it really wasn't um, it really wasn't the answer. What we did find, though, that since we were curing more um, uh, patients with um, antiviral therapy, we also found that they were developing rejection. They were developing rejection uh, during um, uh, antiviral therapy. And typically, of, of interest as well, historically, they developed rejection when their viral loads became negative. So many of us thought this was some type of uh, immune reactivation. But for the fellows, what we, what we also see is that, you know, when you're treating someone, um, when, you, when we were treating their hepatitis C, very often the prograph levels the maintenance program levels dropped. So people, we feel, also developed rejection, maybe because they had subtherapeutic program levels, with the concept being that, you know, the liver is getting better, you're metabolizing the program a little bit uh, more, uh, and thus your levels are going to fall. That's why if someone comes in with rejection, again, unrelated to hepatitis C, if someone comes in with rejection, invariably their program level is going to be high. Why is it? Does that mean there can't be rejection because their program level is high? No, because they have renal, they have liver dysfunction related to the rejection. The program level builds up. Invariably, they also have uh, some renal dysfunction. So if someone comes in with rejection and they have a program level that's low, you know unequivocally that they're not taking their uh, not taking their medicine. So then we uh, had the the benefit of of uh, using the DAAs and. I'm not going to go into pre-transplant antiviral therapy, but I want to just talk about post-transplant viral therapy. That now the, the cure rates remarkably are, you know, exceed 90% of in, in patients. I, I over the last five years, I think I have one patient who did not get cured with typical antiviral therapy. With the, with the problem we have now is choosing what agent um, uh, to use. And you, as you can see from the reference list. Uh, below, all of this has happened very quickly. The first, one of the first uh, uh, studies on this came out, was published in 2015. So over a period of probably four and a half years, the whole natural history of recurrent hepatitis C has, um, has changed. So using the DAAs, the non-interferon regimens, we don't see rejection like we did. Can it occur? Yes, it, it can occur. So you still have to be careful with your program levels when you're treating patients. Typically, I program dose when the patient is on um, uh, antiviral uh, therapy. So the need for retransplant and the associated morbidity of recurrent hepatitis C are dramatically decreasing. There have been several studies now that have shown that patients, that are, the retransplant rate for hep C is, is significantly um, uh, decreasing. So what this is also opening the door for is now I think we can consider more patients who have allograft failure who can be truly evaluated as candidates for retransplant because we're not shifting a lot of, of this emphasis to the patients who have uh, recurrent hepatitis C. So there's a lot of interest now in, in, in not dealing with um, uh, hepatitis C post-transplant, but there may actually be a benefit of decreasing the incidence of diabetes and renal dysfunction. I think there's some preliminary data that's suggesting this. When do we treat hepatitis C? I mean, I think our program has gone through the different uh, philosophies. When the DAs first came out, we thought we should treat everyone before the transplant. Maybe we could prevent them from needing a transplant. I think nowadays we're waiting more and more because of the use of hepatitis C positive donors and treating people post transplant. If someone's hep C is negative, um, before the transplant, it does make their management a little bit easier post-transplant because if the liver tests go up, you know it's not recurrent hepatitis C. You can sort of tweak their immunosuppression a little bit if their numbers go up because it's probably subclinical rejection. This is what we do for the, um, uh, for the hepatitis B uh, patients generally. So 
uh, the impact of the, the DAAs on retransplant rates. Um, uh, previously, the, the, the survival rates for recurrent hepatitis C uh, retransplant were uniformly poor to the point where uh, I think we stopped doing it um, uh, at one point. SVR rates seemingly have beneficial effect on overall survival of hep C uh, patients post-transplant. Uh, 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 the post-transplant survival has improved uh, with SVRs, and all quite uh, remarkable uh, developments, and we're hoping that it's going to mimic the hepatitis B paradigm that started in the early 1990s that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. And I think very rapidly that that's um, uh, happening. And the, the decreasing need to retransplant hep C, I think, is going to allow us to, to reassess the traditional mindset that retransplant results in inferior outcomes. Um, I think a lot of the, the transplant programs are starting to say, well, you know, we should offer retransplant to this patient because they don't have hepatitis C, they don't have portal hypertension, um, uh, maybe they're going to do okay. So I think, as you can see at our recipient review, we're, we're taking some, you know, uh, greater chances made with some of these patients in, in trying to, um, uh, to retransplant them. So in summary, most primary disease Diseases recur post transplant. It always has to remain in your differential diagnosis of abnormal liver chemistry tests. The immune liver diseases all recur but are infrequent uh, uh, causes of allograft uh, failure. Um, there are less retransplants needed for recurrent disease, but allograft failure cases may be increasing. So, we're, all programs are seeing more and more patients who develop chronic rejection or. Um, adult survivors of pediatric transplant who are now coming with uh, allograft failure. So I think this is going to be the, the, the new group of individuals that transplant programs are uh, going to deal with. Recurrent hepatitis C is no longer the bane of the transplant hepatologist existence. It, remarkable changes have occurred in the last um, a couple of years that really have redefined uh, liver transplantation. So new day. Thank you very much. It's a great question. In, in, in general, that's a question that patients uh, ask us. The way I answer that is I, I tell them um, uh, my own experience where you know, we started doing transplants here in 88, and I still see patients who are alive from 88. I have patients at Pittsburgh from, who were transplanted at Pittsburgh who um, uh, were transplanted 34 years ago. So I sort of put it in that perspective, and I tell them, Look, having a transplant is trading one set of problems for another. But if you take care of that gift that you got, you should do okay. With their first graph. With the first graph. With, with, the, with the first graph. But we, we do also tell them, and we're, we're, we're supposed to tell them that, again, retransplantation is sometimes a, a necessity. And, and again, in, in the past, we've, the, the survival rates were not good. But I think as, again, the transplant programs have learned a little bit more we don't have the hepatitis C issue. Maybe we're going to retransplant some people before they get too sick. Maybe the survival rates are not going to be as poor as they were. Sure. Um, for plasma cell No, so not not uh, not uh, autoimmune per se, but PSC and PBC histologically are different, are difficult sometimes histologically to differentiate from chronic rejection. Because chronic rejection, you need you don't you lose bile ducts. So if you don't have all of those bile ducts there, you're not going to see the typical histologic changes of recurrent PBC and PSC. And remember that some of these things run together as well because people with PBC and PSC reject and they can develop chronic rejection. So very often you have both conditions. Good question. Um, talk about doing fiber scans post-transplant. Uh, do, do that on a protocol basis at a certain period of time? 
time, or is it just the same liver no. test? Or have you, have you run into the situation where you got it on someone, their liver test is elevated? Yeah. So uh, I actually have five patients who were longer-term survivors of the transplant. I mean, all all more than ten years out, and they had slightly elevated alkaline phosphatase levels. Doing fine otherwise. So I got a fiber scan on them, and they had an increased fibrosis score, and I biopsied them, and all of them had uh, different degrees of chronic rejection on the biopsy. So and then the next question is, well, what did you do about it? Um, so um, so um, in one patient, I increased their prograph a little bit, and the others I didn't. But how that helped me was it told me that I cannot lower their immunosuppression, right? Because these are the people that if you lower their immunosuppression when they already have this, then they're going to get worse. So that's how the fiber scan helped me in, in, in these patients. Um, minimal. I mean, the, some of them were mild episodes of chronic, mild chronic so rejection. Maybe it's the inflammation that comes along with it. I mean, any you know, an inflammation um, for any reason can you know falsely elevate the fibrosis score. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.